hope to persuade you that the mass flow is obviously much more important than a volumetric flow. And this, this holds true in, in almost industry, any industry that you can think of, because most industries are really driven by molecules and processes and things like that, not, not volumetric flow. Hello, my name's uh, John Smitherman. I'm the chief engineer here at Sierra Instruments. So my intention today uh, would be just to briefly go through with you the importance of mass flow compared to volumetric flow, and then you can draw your own conclusions from that. But that really what's important is the mass flow because that's actually what goes in and out of any kind of a biological reaction would be the, the molecules themselves, not necessarily the volume of the molecules. What would be really helpful at this point would be if you have a minute, we can just review real quickly what's called the ideal gas law. Now, of course, a lot of gases are not totally ideal, but this is a very, very good model for most of the gases that you would see out in the uh, industry, in particular microbiology, things like CO2, oxygen, argon, whatever, common gases uh, follow this law fairly closely. So, talking a little bit about how the ideal gas law applies to uh, pressure. So what we have here is a couple of examples, and what we're trying to show schematically is that for a, for a given volume of space, there's a certain number of molecules within that volume of space. So in this case, schematically, oh, and let me back up a little bit, what's really important when you're dealing in the ideal gas law is that the measurements that you use to do your calculations have to be what we call absolute measurements. So for example, in the, in the realm of pressure, a common unit of measure for us here at CR Instruments would be uh, PSIA, meaning pounds per square inch, uh, absolute. I've tried to highlight that here for you because mass flow calculations always depend on absolute pressure. That's how the, how the molecules behave. So here, here's, this represents one atmosphere being 14.7 PSIA, and we'll call that having a density of one. And that's represented schematically by you know, this many molecules. Now, if you, the, the law says that if you double the pressure from 14.7 PSI to 30.4 PSI A, we've effectively doubled the number of molecules that, that reside in that same space. Hence, the density has, has, has increased from one to two. So that, that's an easy, uh, an easy thing to remember, I hope, and to keep in mind as far as mass flow is concerned compared to volumetric flow, that uh, these the flows are very sensitive to pressure is what we're trying to show here. And then to, to, transfer, to move this over into a real world example, let's say you're, you're a, you have a meter or a controller and you're in Denver trying to do some experiments. You need to be aware that in Denver the atmosphere is thinner, so it's only 12 PSIA in Denver. So if you had a, if you had a volumetric meter that was calibrated in Monterey, California and moved to Denver, you would, uh, you would get an error in mass flow, and that error function is described by this simple equation here, where it's the ratio of the lower pressure in Denver compared to the standard pressure here in Monterey, multiplied by 100 to turn it into a percent. You can see that's a substantial error in flow, 18% just by going from Monterey to Denver on the basis of volumetric gear. The ideal gas law is also uh, not just based on pressure, it's also based on temperature. The same uh, basic recommendations go along with it, and that is that the temperature needs to be measured at absolute temperature. So let's just spend a minute talking about uh, temperature effects the way that we just finished talking about pressure effects. So now we're over here on the ideal gas law as it refers to temperature. 20 degrees Celsius is considered to be a, a normal ambient, atmosphere, ambient temperature like we're standing in right now, only you have, that has to be converted to an absolute temperature as well, which in this case would be degrees Kelvin. So we're back to that model where we're trying to, to show you visually that in, in the atmosphere that's common for us all to live in, you would have this many molecules. But if the temperature, in this case we're going to double the temperature again, absolute temperatures doubled, you see the 293 Kelvin became 586 degrees Kelvin. What the ideal gas law says is that when that happens, your density is, is halved. So the pressure and temperature relationships are inverted. A higher pressure creates higher density, whereas a higher temperature creates lower density. So now, to go back to, to the analogy that we used earlier, let's, let's think about some cases where, what would the error be 
what would the error be if you had some substantial temperature changes? And so what I, what I decided to look at here is, let's say you're in Iowa or somewhere where in the winter maybe it gets to minus 10 C and in the summer it gets fairly hot to 35 degrees C. It's, uh, we need to convert these temperatures back to Kelvin again. So here's our two absolute temperatures. It's going from 263 Kelvin to 308 degrees Kelvin. Similar equation to the pressure, only the numbers are flipped over. So in this case, we have a 263 Kelvin divided by the 308 Kelvin times 100 to give us a, a, actually a 15% change in mass flow just based on a seasonal change in a place like Iowa. So I think, I think this is a real nice, quick overview of the ideal gas law and how I hope to persuade you that the mass flow is obviously much more important than a volumetric flow. And this, this holds true in, in almost industry, any industry that you can think of because most industries are really driven by molecules and processes and things like that, not, not volumetric flow.